want to, to hand it over to Paul and uh, Robert to talk about OSC. Uh, if you have slides to share, I can. Yeah, perfect. Uh, if I can share my screen, that would be great. Perfect. So you can also see it. Got it. Cool. Great. Um, yeah, overlays capture architecture. Um, thanks for thanks for having us. Um, I'll give you a, a very quick whistle stop tour of the of the architecture and, and a bit of uh, my background and Robert's background. Um, so my name is Paul Knowles. I'm the um, head of the advisory council at the Human Colossus Foundation. Uh, I also lead the inputs and semantics working group at Trust Over IP, and I'm on the steering committee of uh, COVID-19 Credentials Initiative. Um, and uh, lead their, the schema task force uh, at CCI. Um, so uh, my background is in clinical trials. Uh, I've been in, uh, in uh, data management for over 25 years. And uh, one of the issues that uh, we've always had uh, in, in farms is when you uh, work on two uh, sister trials, uh, when you go to aggregate the data at the end of the uh, at the end of the trial uh, for better analytics and stuff, there's always been these teething issues with trying to get those uh, those uh, all the data aggregated, uh, and it can be silly little things like you know somebody's uh, defined the length of the attribute uh, differently, and then when you go and uh, aggregate it, uh, all of the data truncates, or you can have you know, different date for, date formats, et cetera. And they always cause these kind of, um, these uh, merging issues. Um, so uh, overlays capture architecture, I kind of got fed up of it and eventually thought, oh, let's just go back to basics and let's see, see how they're capturing data and see if we can um, come up with a better architecture for, uh, for so that all that, those sort of coloration points don't get in the way of, 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 of the merging. Uh, you guys all know what a schema is, so I won't bother with that, but this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, so um, a schema base, you can kind of think as a, 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 a very generic and simple uh, schema. So it contains things like attributes and, and types, and there's actually a flagging block in the schema base so that you can flag any PII attributes at source. So if any data is dragged through that structure, it's automatically flagged. Um, and then everything else is kind of task specific uh, um, overlay, we call them, uh, and they're cryptographically linked to that schema base. So it will be things like uh, all of your human readable labels will be in a separate object, which is then linked to the schema base. All of your, um, your formats will be in a different object. And, and it has some very interesting characteristics when you start doing that, especially when you start thinking of things like internationalization uh, when you go and resolve something, uh, you know, resolve a credential, say, um, on, on a mobile phone, because rather than having to rebuild the entire schema, say the Chinese government wants to uh, have that schema resolve in uh, Chinese, they can still use the same schema base, but they can just uh, put in their own um, label overlay or, uh, or entry overlay for uh, human readable labels in Chinese or predefined entries in Chinese. That sort of thing. So that's kind of just a very high level view of what the architecture uh, does. Um, I should say it's an architecture, not an ontology. So it's basically we're just defining some rules on on how the data should be captured. But uh, it's ontology ag agnostic and it works very well in things like a transformation pipeline where you might be going from fire to uh, W3C verifiable credential. Uh, it can kind of get piped through OCA uh, and then you can resolve all the credentials uh, at the W3C end in uh, multiple languages. Um, so uh, let me see, I'm just gonna whiz through this because we haven't got that much time. Data pooling, stable schema bases, flagged attributes for encryption, data decentralization, internationalization. So depending on where uh, what your, your job role is, uh, depends which of these uh, things um, we tend to pitch. So you know, for people that are maybe less uh, tech, uh, uh, techie, we say that uh, it's very good for internationalization because it's something they can really see. But for people that are maybe further deep into the stack, you know, we, we, we harp on about, uh, you know, better data pooling and better, uh, um, you know, clean data for analytics and AI. Uh, so, yeah, so I can go through a few of these. Schema base is obviously the, this, this is the most important object, really. This is what you, you link everything to this. So all of the overlay objects, they basically have a decentralized resource identifier in the metadata of the overlay object, which points to this schema base. So you cryptographically link it by 
a decentralized resource identifier. And I should say that that's important because we don't use URL, URLs at all in any of this. We don't care where you house any of these things. We only care that the, that the DRI, which is basically a, a hash fingerprint of the object, um, is, uh, is deterministic. So, uh, you know, this hash, wherever it is on Mars, Jupiter, Earth, any network, this hash means this, uh, this capture base or this overlay. Um, so you know exactly what it is. Um, character encoding overlay. So this is obviously, it's usually UTF-8, but if you wanted to have some strange character set, you could, uh, you know, put something else in here. Um, an entry overlay is for all your predefined entries. So again, you can put your predefined entries in 47 different languages uh, and just swap them in, in and out as you need. Uh, label overlays for human readable labels and category labels. Again, in, in multiple languages, you can have them. Uh, format overlay, uh, yeah, for things like date formats, all that sort of stuff, you can put them in there. And an information overlay. So this is like where you have your, where you have the little eye icon next to a field. Uh, you, again, for uh, data entry tips, it could be done in, in any language. Um, so we, we tend to use information overlays quite a lot as well. The only, so that's all basically for the issuer of the schema, all of those objects, but there's one that we reserve specifically for the holder and that's a, a sensitive overlay. So to give you an example why, why this might be useful, something like gender, for instance, gender is not PII um, at all, uh, but in Thailand, uh, you know, in Thailand they have, uh, you know, the government recognizes, I think it's 18 different gender types, right? So. If you if you go to uh, if you're a Thai citizen and you're from a small village in Thailand, then suddenly your gender might become a little bit more sensitive than it is in the Western world, um, and and easier to target those people. So in that, that case, you, uh, that Thai resident could use a sensitive overlay to say, if anybody asks for my gender from this particular schema, then uh, I want to automatically flag it uh, at, at my end on my on my from my data vault, for instance. Blinding identity taxonomy. Uh, this is basically um, a, a taxonomy that's housed at Kantar Initiative. I spearheaded this with, uh, with uh, Elizabeth Ranieris um, and we came up with 47 different uh, attributes that could potentially um, unblind the identity of a governing entity. So there's 47 elements here. Uh, some are very generic, like freeform text fields should always be flagged. Um, or, you know, if in doubt, dates, dates, dates should always be flagged as well. But, you know, dates are sometimes fine, but if in doubt, flag them. But yeah, this kind of gives you a list of, so that an issuer has something to reference for the PII bl block in the capture base of what to flag. Uh, okay, so I don't think I need to go through the demographics form too much. It's just, I'm just kind of highlighting here which overlays take care of which bits. So you've obviously got entry for predefined entries, et cetera, labels for the human readable labels. Um, yeah, so that's all that. So you just kind of think of it as a, a, a the schema as a, a multi-dimensional object, if you like, which is truly interoperable. Um, there's a little bit of code here. I think it's, it's, uh, it's, these are old, it's an old deck, so it's a little bit out of date, but you'll get the idea here. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's just basically attributes types, and then you've got that blinding block at the bottom, um, a little bit of metadata at the top, but then the overlays, you'll see in the overlays, they've got the schema base and the metadata there, which is basically a, a, a DRI of the, of the capture, capture base. So, um, that's how you uh, that's how you cryptographically link those objects. Uh, entry overlay again. That's for all your predefined entries. Um, so this one's obviously in U.S. English. Um, this is for all your uh, la all your labels and categories. Uh, again, that one's got a language option in the metadata. So this is again English uh, U.S. Format overlays. Uh, blah blah blah. Information. So this is for that that uh, that. Um, data entry tips. Again, this one's in English. Um, the, you'll see in the capture uh, base, which is this one, this one you'll see there's a classification field in the, in the metadata. So we use uh, GIX, GIX codes are one of the classification um, um, that we use. So GIX is a global industry classification sector. So in this case, we know that this schema has been uh, issued by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and I can kind of show you why that's important. So say Roche has built a, uh, a demographic schema 
um, and then Novartis just wants to change, uh, you know, add add some predefined entries to a couple of the attributes. They can just swap out that overlay, put in their own overlay, and then it's uh, it's built into the stack. Same thing, maybe uh, uh, somebody wants a, some new, uh, some different human readable labels. Uh, maybe maybe they want it in a different language. Uh, Pfizer can do that so and add that if, to the. Yeah. If I could make one sort of, of semi, actually quarter thought out suggestion overall, and yeah, sure. apologies, I've, I've, I've taken my TAC hat off completely here and put on my geek hat. Um, mm -hmm. um, so this is not about TAC advice at all. This is purely geek hat stuff. Um, this reminds me tremendously of Docker containers and the way Docker container and their layers work. And it may uh, be Rob, worth- Robert, do you want to answer that? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely that's a very good analogy because actually when you think about the, the, the composition mechanism of this architecture, it's exactly the same intention that you have the smaller pieces which you can build on top of it and you can reuse the pieces across so you can create a very rich schema which then is very useful towards uh, you know, kind of knowledge graphs and reasoning and data processing and whatever comes later. Yeah, the, so the, 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 reason, the reason I brought it up, the reason I brought it up is that you may want to look at Docker by analogy in terms of usability tricks, because very few people realize that the fundamental technologies in use in Docker, things like OverlayFS, that had been around for over a decade and yeah. gone nowhere until Docker brought usability that set the world on fire to that. And so having a really well thought out usability in this kind of a layered structure, and you may be able to borrow some ideas from the Docker folks, um, mm -hmm. could make all the difference. Because like I said, the overlay technology went absolutely nowhere for well over a decade until somebody set the usability on fire. Yeah, we are fully aware of that. So we are, we, we are getting that uh, towards the direction of uh, of increasing the adoptions, let's say, but uh, definitely the usability is the, one of the key aspects of that. But thank you very much for the comment. Thanks, Ed. Um, so I'm, I'm nearly at the end of this um, deck, but I just wanted to let you know that I was, uh, I, I led the, the drafting group for the standard data models and elements um, stuff at the Good Health Pass Collaborative recently. So um, we kind of did all the, the common data models and the, the, the data defined the data elements and also looked to the semantic harmonization piece and, and uh, an OCA was, uh, was put in as a recommendation for semantic harmonization. So I just wanted to show you where that kind of fits in within the data pipeline. Um, so uh, yeah, so this is obviously OCA, uh, transient objects such as credentials and passes can be easily resolved in multiple languages. And where it kind of fits in, this is one of the diagrams from the Good Health Pass uh, blueprint is basically we're looking at going from uh, something like fire uh, to a uh, which is could be persistent records on a database and going to transient verifiable objects so w3c verifiable credentials and where oca sits is right in the middle so it basically uh, we uh, we're building a data pipeline that will take fire and uh, and then push it through oca to to come up with all the to come up with the right architecture so that it can be multilingual credentialing and then it goes to w3c verifiable credentials and then this this is just a schematic of the of, of the data pipeline that we're that we're uh, that we're building so that's kind of all I had, but what, what I wanted to suggest to Linux Foundation Public Health is we're obviously going to get behind the, the Global COVID Certificate Network, GCCN, um, and, uh, and we're definitely going to be building OCA into, the, uh, into this data pipeline. Um, MedCreds, for example, and uh, COVID, COVID Credentials Initiatives, those guys, uh, they, they, they love OCA and they want to use it. So what we were thinking of is maybe take, getting a, a, what we call an OCA repository, uh, which is basically, uh, um, Robert, do you want to briefly describe the, the characteristics of the OCA repository? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, overall, starting with the just purely objects, I think the most important to understand is that those objects are created in mind of uh, facilitating something which we call the authentic data economy. Uh, so basically capturing the data and harmonizing the data is one of the key aspects, which a lot of actually communities just keep at the start because they think, yeah, we'll take care of that later, which obviously never works. Um, basically the purpose of that architecture is to, first of all, to capture the context of the data so you can uh, uh, understand the origin of the information which you are capturing. Then you have immutable objects. So all the objects which Paul showed you are immutable objects. It means that you have uh, 
uh, self-addressing identifiers referencing to the content of that information so we care what it is and not what where it is so comparing that to the schema.org where you have just a location of something which you can think of about like what will happen with that object in two or three years if it will be still the same if it will be still there and so on so uh, immutability is very important from the perspective anything which you are thinking of your whole credential any security aspect as you probably know if you want to cryptographically commit to something it has to be immutable it cannot be a dynamic link or dynamic content behind that so this is very important from that architectural perspective so we can facilitate all the verifiable credential aspects of the data which which people are talking about and obviously on the examples you, you saw the the json serialization but obviously the architecture is agnostic towards the serialization it could be xml it could be json we experiment a little bit with the json ld as well in the context of the linked data but as maybe you are aware of that uh, through the mechanism how the data are linked is not sufficient to use that for the secure aspects of the use cases which we have means that you you do not have immutability in those references across that and obviously the whole con concept of uh, reasoning and predicates and and uh, link, uh, link um, label property graphs and any type of the knowledge graphs which uh, one of the projects which we are building right now is the data sharing hub as, a, as an example how that uh, can allows you for uh, uh, have a mean of for the discoverability mechanism on on top of your data sets which you are collecting in any mean and then obviously the OC repository which Paul mentioned is basically a form of uh, a centralized registry with decentralized control over those objects means that basically a propagation discover discoverability mechanism for the objects you can think of uh, uh, um, as we said uh, with the uh, immutability aspects and the self-addressing uh, uh, characteristics of those objects it doesn't matter where it is but what it is so you could imagine that you could even throw it on solutions like decentralized storage uh, ipfs and and similar things and you can cryptographically verify the the provenance of that information who issued it when issued it, if it's exactly the same thing which i'm referring to and so on so we'll see a repository is just a mean of the discoverability mechanism make it easier to distribute the, the content ac across the governance uh, authority thanks robert i was just i was just going to show you guys here this is a this is a, a spreadsheet that can get passed into the oca parser directly off this so um, you know, you, this is where we do all of the different languages and stuff. So obviously this is English. You've got an entry over, overlay there in, in column E uh, and an information in F, but then we've got, you know, German, French, Italian. So you can go as many, uh, as many languages as you want. And what that basically resolves to in the, um, in our tooling, I'll just share. This. So I'll, I'll use that exact, uh, oops, I'll use that exact one. Can you see this? Uh, if I type some stuff in here, you can still see, hopefully. Yeah, so here, if we kind of just bring this up, I can upload this and that's the one there. So when, when you look at it in preview mode here, you'll see that all those different languages, so it's all in French, but it's all done with overlays. So it's kind of, you know, the, the label overlays are pulling all these things in French, information overlays are pulling in all this entry stuff. Uh, sorry, all your information for, for data entry. And then you've got all your predefined entries are in French. But then when you change it to uh, to German, uh, everything changes again. So uh, everything then resolves into German, including all your predefined entries. Uh, same with uh, Italian. Uh, and obviously, so you can understand what, what all this is uh, in, in English. Um, so, so, and obviously the capture base has remained exactly the same through the whole, whole, the whole process. So for something like, uh, you know, the, the COVID stuff, when, uh, you know, it's very useful for uh, jurisdiction, jurisdiction interoperability. So, you know, basically a, a governance authority can say, we want to use this capture base. And then, you know, the Chinese government can say, yep, we're, we'll, we'll adopt that. And here's some Chinese overlays that you can use for that capture base. German government can do the same for, for Germany. And, and uh, if it's all through this kind of OCA repository, then it's all interoperable. So, um, so the idea we had was to, to approach Linux Foundation Public Health about you know setting up a, an OCA repository for you guys so that all of your projects can uh, can start working with this architecture. So just skated skated it in, James. That was probably the quickest I've ever done the 
done that presentation. Yeah, that was quick. Yeah, we're, we're coming right up to the very end. So I, I, I think we should we should definitely revisit this. So there's a couple of questions that, that I would have about it. And let's see if we can schedule some time on the next on the next week. Uh, uh, governance around the OCA repository, you know, kind of what what that looks like. Um, would you consider OCA becoming a, a Linux Foundation project? Right. Um, you know, so the, I, I think there's there's a whole slew of, of discussions we can have around that. So if you don't mind uh, coming back in, in in a couple of weeks, let's put it back on and let's. I'll, I'll definitely yeah. have some discussion points. Yeah, I'd be very interested in that. And my questions would be mainly around IP patents and the yeah. Geeks code. Who owns that? How to get new one, etc., etc., etc. Because I think this could be useful, but I'm just worried about how open it is. I will say, yeah, Rob, super impressive, super impressive. Okay. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, Robert, did you quickly want to answer the IP and stuff? Well, I've got a dash, so um, oh, okay. feel free. I yeah, can yeah, watch yeah. the recording. But Basically, it's open, as open it can be for now. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, obviously it's not public domain yet, but uh, we are trying to figure it out how to protect properly. And obviously, uh, collaboration with the Linux Foundation and putting that into the Linux Foundation ecosystem is one of the options to protect that from the perspective of the architecture. So happy to let's, discuss that topic. Yeah, let's let's expand on that in two weeks, and we'll and we'll go from there. But excellent, thank you all. I hope you all have a fantastic uh, uh, weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks.